both salvation and being saved include in the very nature of their definition, deliverance. There has never been and never will be a biblical concept connected to your salvation that did not include your deliverance. Can a Christian get deliverance? You don't get saved without it. What does it mean to be more than a church? How can a Christian have an experience that's greater than religion? Can everyone actually understand what the Bible is saying? Is revival for today? Are we undergoing a reformation? Tell me more about apostolic apologetics. Welcome to the More Than a Church podcast. Hello and welcome to the More Than a Church podcast podcast. I am so excited. I believe we're on episode number seven. If so, that's really kind of prophetic. We're going to be talking about the completed work of Christ. Number seven biblically represents many times completion, the completed order of God. Seven days God created everything. Well, on six days he created, seventh day he rested. But it has to do with completion, a week, time, So we're going to be talking about the completed work of Christ. Of course, I am your host, Zach Breckenridge. For those of you who don't know me, let me introduce myself. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. I am so excited. If you're joining again, thanks for coming back. Hopefully you're starting to get into the routine like I am of this podcast and the type of content that's going to come out. I have so enjoyed this and I'm so looking forward to future episodes. If you are new, welcome to the channel. If you haven't already, whether you've been watching since episode one or this is your first time, make sure you go ahead and like, subscribe, turn on those notifications, share it to all of your social media platforms by liking, subscribing, turning on those notifications. You get the opportunity to be among the first to find out when new content is Release by the time this one releases, it'll be about a week out from uh, the a live that I just did with Prophet Philip Bryant. It was a powerful time of ministry uh, that's available for replay on his Facebook and YouTube. We're talking about doing some future episodes where we can stream it over here as well. And so more than a church podcast, the podcast is coming out every week, but you want to make sure you like, subscribe, turn on those notifications because I have a vision from the Lord for us to bring more and more content and types of and styles of content to you through this platform. So the podcast is the baseline of where we are and what we're starting with, but there's a ton of great content. So hopefully you've begun to see our shorts or reels on Instagram. You can follow my Instagram as well at Zach Breckenridge. It's where my ministry page is. It's connected to our church page at LifeBridge Jonesboro. Big exciting announcement coming for our local church if you're a part of it. So you're going to want to make sure to follow that content as well. Whenever you share our content, please make sure you use the hashtag, hashtag more than a church. This begun um, out of a move of God's heart back when our church was first starting. Uh, God began to really give us language for what he was doing that was unique in our local church. And now uh, this concept of experiencing church the way Jesus wanted to, creating an experience for believers that's greater than religion, it's really begun to develop into an entire movement. I didn't actually grab it, but I do have a book that's available on Amazon that's titled Hashtag More Than a Church as well. And it's actually, it's five apostolic keys to access that revival lifestyle and to experience more than church. Um, But really what it actually was, was it developed out of me re-articulating the core values and what made us different as a church. So especially if you're a part of our local gathering, you definitely want to check that out. Uh, But if you are a leader in ministry, let me tell you, when we began to utilize those five keys, um, God changed the way he was meeting with people in our services. Lives began to change and transform like we'd never seen before. Um, All right, yeah, we are on episode seven today. I'm excited about today's content. 
it's going to be a good one. There's a ton of content that's already out there addressing this matter, um, but I know that the perspective that I'm going to provide will be unique. So let's go ahead and get into it. Let's talk about what we're going to talk about tonight. Tonight, we are going to answer the question, and it's a loaded question. There's a lot of it lot that we have to talk about before we can get to that question. But we're going to talk about tonight, can a Christian have a demon? Can a Christian have a demon? Now, as I already mentioned, you probably have already got an answer that's in your mind. There's, as I said, a ton of content already out there that's addressing this. And if you've heard me address it before, I'm sure some of this is going to be a review. I try to do my best to compile a lot of different content from multiple messages that I put together for this one. I have more notes for this podcast than any of the other episodes that I've recorded prior to this. Um, so I'm going to do my best to still pull up some logos and some Bible. I'll try not to get too deep into preach, but I've got a ton of content and I also hope that I'm not on here preaching for three hours. But when it comes to to answering this question, can a Christian have a demon, and the topic of deliverance, it's a loaded question. There's a lot of content to be covered, and I want to do my best to try to cover all of it in a timely manner with you. If you've never heard me speak on this, I promise, even if you've heard of this topic before, I'm going to provide, as I said, a unique depth and perspective on this topic. Now, before we can answer this question, we must have a basic understanding of the development of the deliverance ministry. We have to understand where deliverance came from, where it derived, how it developed throughout the Testaments. What deliverance was in the Old Testament is not the same that it is in the New Testament. Uh, deliverance from demons is connected in its roots, its origins, to another biblical concept. So we have to understand the foundations of deliverance and who deliverance began for, how it progressed throughout the covenants, before we can really understand who deliverance is for, and we answer that question finally of, can a Christian have a demon? Is that something that all Christians can have? How do we get to this place believers where we don't have to go through deliverance time and time again, right? Because it seems like oftentimes in those deliverance movements, sometimes we get this false narrative of, well, I can never get free. And we're going to break through some of those mindsets tonight. I'm excited about this topic. I hope you're excited about it as well. Jesus came to set the captives free and this is a big portion of what Jesus did during his ministry on the earth. When Jesus came, the reason that Jews misunderstood him as Messiah is because they, they believed the Messiah was going to come and be this military diplomatic force that came in and overthrew all the physical oppression of man, of God's people. But he was coming to establish a spiritual kingdom as well as the earthly kingdom. And he was primarily there to overthrow the demonic spirits that were oppressing them more than just what was naturally happening to them during his time of ministry on earth. All right. So before we get into this, we have to understand this concept of the deliverance ministry. Deliverance as I kind of teased just a moment ago, deliverance from demons is connected to the biblical concept known as the finger of God, the finger of God. Somebody type that in the comments. Maybe you can even do the little pointing finger emoji, finger of God up front. We need to understand this deliverance. When we talk about deliverance, whether we're talking about a demon within someone, so possession a demon upon or influencing someone, oppression, demonic people groups that are uh, even what was going on in the days of Jesus. There were these demonic people groups that were oppressing the Jews from being able to culturally express their, their worship to God at many times. Or even if it's deliverance from a mindset, a demonic mindset, this thought pattern and processes that don't align with the way that God thinks and the way that God thinks about us, getting free from any level of demonic activity at all is deliverance. So oftentimes, Christians, we spend a lot of our time 
discussing and debating the semantics of inside, outside, possession, oppression. Is this a soul issue? Is it spirit? Is this just a healing? Was there a level of demonic infiltration there? Baseline, bottom line is this. Getting free from demonic activity is deliverance. If there was anything going on in the atmosphere at all that had something to do with a demon and that demon is no longer allowed to infiltrate and have influence on the atmosphere around your life, that is deliverance. Regardless of its position and proximity, deliverance took place. Now, deliverance began by God in the Old Testament, but it developed almost into something new in the new covenant. Now, I said deliverance is connected to the finger of God. Now, the Bible, what's really intriguing about this, even though deliverance is very popping in the new covenant, in the New Testament, the concept of the finger of God is only mentioned four times. So we can very quickly come to an understanding of this concept of finger of the finger of God and how that is connected and develops into deliverance. Now, it's really important for us to understand this. Out of those four times that the Bible mentions the concept of the finger of God, four of those, or out of those four times, three of those times are in the Old Testament. It's only mentioned one time in the New Testament. All three of the references in the Old Testament are in the Torah. That's the books of the law, the first five books of our modern Bible. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Torah. And in the New Covenant, when Jesus references this in the New Testament, he's referencing then a concept that's familiar to all all of God's people, not just the scholars. Now, here's what I mean by that. It was the responsibility for all of God's people to be familiar with the first five books of the Bible. All of God's people were aware of the Torah. They were responsible to, to, the Bible says, like, put it as frontlets between your eyes. They were supposed to, when they woke up, discuss the Torah. When they sat down for lunch, discuss the Torah. They were supposed to write it over their doorpost, put it as frontlets between their eyes. Before they go to bed, talk about the Torah. The Torah, there was active times of reading the Torah and specific times were specific proportions portions of the Torah, the law was read throughout the year, every year to remind God's people of the different elements of the law. So when Jesus references something from the law, it's important because every one of God's people was familiar with the law. It was almost like in Jewish societies, you had to earn a right to become a scholar to to study out, say like the prophets and the topics such as the wisdom literature. And there were different sections of Jewish faith that didn't even believe all the portions of that. Like the Pharisees and Sadducees, they they held to different portions of the prophets and the wisdom literature. So when Jesus is talking to this, he, he was referencing a concept that was familiar to all of God's people. But the reality is, Now for Christians, when we mention this concept about the finger of God, it's something that's pretty relatively removed from most of us. Even as I opened up this podcast and I say, well, deliverance all originated and is connected to the concept of the finger of God. Most of us have this preconceived notion and this idea of what deliverance is and what it looks like and who it's for and who it's not. But I would say there's a much smaller percentile of us who have heard of this concept of the finger of God. Unless maybe you watched the movie Finger of God that came out, I don't know, about a decade or so ago. But for most of us, that's not a teaching that we've heard very often. But when Jesus references it in the New Covenant, his people were familiar with what he was talking about. So, Three references in the Old Testament, only one in the New Testament. If you'll remind yourself when Moses goes in to confront confront Pharaoh, and he goes ten different times, five times Pharaoh hardens his heart, five times God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And what's interesting is there are ten different plagues that come upon the Egyptians before 
Pharaoh finally agrees to let them go. And once he lets them go, he kind of, it doesn't take long for him to say, oh, that was a really bad idea. We need them as slaves. Go and send the soldiers to put them back into slavery. During the third plague that came upon Egypt, I want you to listen to what is said because who introduces this concept to us of the finger of God is actually really, really interesting to me. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 19, it says, Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had already said. So when we're first introduced to this in the Torah, which was written by Moses, these first five books all written by Moses, the tail end of it probably written by his disciple Joshua, as Joshua takes over and then writes the next sixth book of the Bible. Moses, though, is writing this, and our introduction to the finger of God was actually introduced from those who observed how God was operating on behalf of his people. And the magicians were trying to replicate what Moses was doing. And at this point in the third plague, they say, listen, this is by the finger of God. We can't replicate what is happening here because this was done not by Moses, but by God himself. Now, Moses, as was instructed by the Lord, had told Aaron, his brother, to strike his staff on the ground and it turned the dust into gnats. That was the plague that they were discussing in this. And the magicians, they couldn't mimic that plague. So their conclusion to Pharaoh is, what Moses is doing here is not being done by Moses' own power, nor is Moses operating in the deceptive arts of magic. They remark, this is the finger of God. Now, what, was, what God was ultimately doing for the congregation or the nation of his people in this book is, well... The book of Exodus is, in summary, a story of God's people exiting Egypt, right? That's what the Exodus is. God's people are exiting Egypt. Well, we know that the ten plagues from extra-biblical resources was actually God. God was within each plague confronting a different demonic principality that was enthroned at that time in Egypt. So each plague that God released was God confronting a different false god, a different demonic principality that Pharaoh had enthroned in Egypt during that time. So each plague was God calling out a different demon. Man, this is getting good. I hope y'all, whoo, I'm already feeling the Holy Ghost on this. Now listen to this. The prophet Isaiah much later released a prophecy concerning Egypt. And I'm going to read the first portion of this prophecy because it gives us some language for what God was doing all the way back in the book of Exodus. Isaiah chapter 19. Listen to the opening of this prophecy. Isaiah writes an oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt, and the idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them, and I will stir up against Egypt stir up Egyptians against Egyptians. And they will fight each against another and each against his neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. Remember what Jesus said, a kingdom that's divided against itself shall not stand. And he was actually going through deliverance when that happened. I think I might mention that later. So just hold that thought. Verse 3 of Isaiah 19. And the spirit of the Egyptians, the, the what? The spirit of the Egyptians within them will be emptied out, and I will confound their counsel, and they will inquire of their idols and the sorcerers and the mediums and the necromancers, all those magicians, and I will give over the Egyptians into the hand of a hard master. master excuse me. And a fierce king will rule over them, declares the Lord God of hosts. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah is describing that what God is dealing with here in this prophecy is known as the spirit of the Egyptians. The spirit of the Egyptians. Have you ever heard about 
that and all the demonology teaching that you've heard and learned on the internet and social media, YouTube? Have you learned yet about the spirit of the Egyptians? The spirit of the Egyptians is really important because the spirit of the Egyptians was the very first deliverance service that God began. What was God removing his people? Let me say this. Was God removing his people from the physical location of Egypt? Yes. But what God was actually doing was conducting deliverance. He was delivering his people from Egypt. But not just the land and not just the physical oppression of Pharaoh. God was conducting a corporate deliverance from the spirit of the Egyptians. I want you to hear this next passage. It's the next time that the finger of God is mentioned. And Israel is at this time outside of Egypt. Right? They're an entire nation. They're kind of, they're at the precipice of their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And listen to the response from Jethro, that's Moses' father-in-law. Listen to how Moses' father-in-law responds to what God has just done. This is Exodus chapter 18. I'm going to pull up some later passages when we get in and we start really diving into it, but I've already got these pulled up in my notes, so I'm just going to read it for you. Exodus chapter 18, verses 10 through 12 says this, Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now, I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair, they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God And Aaron came with the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Now, I mentioned that was the second time that the finger of God was mentioned. I said that incorrectly. That's not the second time. I'm I'm getting to the second time. We're going to get there in just a second. All right. But what's going on here is Jethro is describing what is taking place And what has happened when Israel came out of Egypt? And what did he say? God, the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair, they dealt arrogantly with the people. And he begins to offer a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And he calls in Aaron and the elders to come and eat bread with him. And what did, what's he celebrating? The Lord, he said, blessed be the Lord who has delivered you. Where they get deliverance from? They got deliverance from the spirit of the Egyptians. This was a deliverance service. The book of Exodus is a book of deliverance. Now, the law of God, the second book of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, our Bible, it's an entire book about deliverance. The second reference to this concept is, is found later in this same book also. It's a text you're more likely going to be familiar with. And then I'll read the third reference to go with it as well. Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, it says, And he gave to Moses, when he had finished speaking on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And the third time that it's used is Deuteronomy chapter 9, Verse 10. Now, the book of Deuteronomy, in many cases, recounts much of what had already happened. It's almost like a book of summary of the history of Israel's formation. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10 says, And the Lord gave me, as Moses is recounting all this, the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words that the Lord had spoken with you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. And he goes on in that passage as well. The first time that God presents to Moses the Ten Commandments, the Bible says that the original copies were written by the finger of God. Now, if you'll remember, Moses, when he goes down, he sees that 
Aaron has already led the people in taking all their jewelry off that they had from Egypt, and they, they smelt it down, and they form a, a golden image, a golden idol, and they begin to worship this golden idol. And Moses comes down off the mountain with his assistant, his disciple Joshua, and at first they think the people are in war, or maybe they're worshiping, and then they're like, oh my God, they're worshiping a false idol. And Moses throws the tablets that are written with the finger of God down, and they break. Later, Moses goes back up on the mountain, and God says, this time you got to write my word down with your own fingers. You're going to carve it in the tablets today. It's because of what Moses did that preachers are still writing the word of God on tablets. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, so the first time, though, that God presents to Moses the Ten Commandments, we see it in both references there, Exodus 31 and Deuteronomy 9. The first time he presents the Ten Commandments, the Bible says the original copies were written with the finger of God. They were written with the finger of God. This means that the Word of God written by the finger of God was always a part of God's original plan to bring deliverance for his people. Let me say that again. That means that the word of God, written by the finger of God, was always a part of God's original plan to bring deliverance to his people. The first logos, the first written element of God's word was the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were presented to Moses to give God's people complete deliverance. Let me say it this way, so that they could maintain the deliverance that they just received from Egypt. God just delivered his people from the spirit of the Egyptians and the Ten Commandments were given to them not as a list of do this and don't do this. It was a legal document from heaven that was signed by the finger of God and it instructed God's people how they could remain in a close relationship with him now that he had saved them out of slavery. He had saved them from the desires of the world and he delivered them from both Egypt and the spirit of the Egyptians. The word of God is not just a document to tell you that you are a sinner. The Bible is the legal document for believers which should teach us how to remain in a close relationship to God once we are saved and delivered. Now, now that we understand how the finger of God originated in the old covenant and how it is connected to our concept of deliverance, let's look at, and I'll pull this up now. Let me pull up the screen share, and then I'll have to go over and change it to our reference. We're going to be in Luke chapter 11. Oh, I may already have it pulled up. Verse 14 through 23. Perfect. It's already there. So this is our new covenant reference from Jesus. Let's read it, and we'll talk about it. Luke chapter 11, verse 14 through 23. It says, now... He, and we're talking about Jesus here, you can scroll up. The translators give us the benefit of the doubt and tell us this is Jesus and this confrontation that has to do about Beelzebub. But as we go up to the beginning of the chapter, we can see it's about Jesus. So Jesus was casting a de casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. They weren't seeking a sign that Jesus was the Messiah. They're really seeking a sign in this moment that what he's doing is being led by a demon. They're seeking a sign so that they can crucify him. All right, let's continue. Verse 17, it says, But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. I mentioned that earlier. I said we were going to get into this. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will, will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do, you, whom do your sons cast them out. Now, let me pause for just a minute. Let me mention this because Beelzebul is directly translated as Lord of the Flies, and it's this um, spirit of death and decay uh, that is known as one of the higher ranking demons that was active during Jesus' ministry on earth. Let me look at and see if this has 
a footnote on one of these. Where's the first time? It's not on this one. That's kind of interesting. All right, anyway. Jesus said, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But, listen to this. This is where it gets interesting. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Powerful teaching that's going on from Jesus. There we go. I got you back. Switched over to the wrong screen for just a moment. Don't panic. The Lord has delivered you back to the teaching. When Jesus comes on the scene and he begins his ministry, so he's born of the Virgin Mary. It takes him like 30 years on earth before he ever actually begins to operate in ministry. His ministry is really short. It's like three years. But deliverance, as Jesus started his ministry, it shifts from something that God's doing for all of his people, a corporate deliverance, to a personal ministry. We have to understand that before Jesus came, people didn't get delivered from personal demons. You couldn't receive deliverance from your daddy's generational demons. Now, God would deliver his people corporately from something that they were all dealing with or all under the oppression of, but... Jesus comes and he says, you can receive deliverance personally now because God is personally here on the earth. This is no longer just about God's covenant with a people. This is about a covenant personal relationship that we have with Jesus, our, our salvation. And Jesus says the deliverance ministry comes from the kingdom of God. He said, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then you know that the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, Recall with me, what, what was it that we discussed on the very first podcast? What was the gospel? We, we talked about what was the gospel that Jesus instructed his, his followers to preach? What was the gospel message that Jesus came preaching? Because Jesus mentioned the term gospel well before he ever told anyone that he was the Messiah, that he was going to die, that he was going to resurrect, any of that. Before he started teaching on any of that, Jesus introduced this term gospel. Jesus' first sermon we find in Matthew chapter 4, and in verse 17, we find his entire sermon in one verse. It's before the longest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. That's Matthew 5, 6, 7. Those three chapters, Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount. But in Matthew chapter 4, we have Jesus' first sermon. It said, from that time, this is verse 17, from that time, Jesus began preaching, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first time the term gospel is used in the Bible is found just a little bit later in that chapter, verse 23 through 24. And it says, And Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them all, right? The Bible goes in and explains all the different types of healings that Jesus performed and delivered. Jesus taught that the gospel of the kingdom was at hand. What's that mean? It, it's near to you. It's so close that you can reach out and touch it. It's at your fingertips, we might say. And when Jesus begins to begins to when Jesus begins his ministry, when he starts, he starts with his proclamation. And as Jesus begins his proclamation about the nearness of the kingdom of God, the good news that God's kingdom is at hand, two signs are present here: healing and deliverance from demons. Now it was the healing ministry, and Jesus began operating in the healing ministry, and that was what this, made the deliverance ministry necessary. Jesus realized, oh, you don't need healing. This person's oppressed from a demon. And then he begins to cast out devils. Now, that's how Jesus began his ministry. 
Let's fast forward a few chapters later into uh, later into the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew's Gospel account. And let's listen to Jesus' instructions as he sends his first disciples out into the world now. I know we're getting into this quickly. Like I said, there's a lot for us to cover. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 8. Listen to Jesus sending out his first disciples. So Jesus' ministry began, and he introduced deliverance as a personal ministry, and that happened at the beginning of his ministry. Listen to how Jesus sends out his disciples into the world. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 8. It says, These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost house of the sheep of Israel. We're going to find out why he says that in just a few moments. But he says, And proclaim as you go, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he continued on in verse 8, and he said, That's what you're going to proclaim, and this is the demonstration that matches that proclamation. Listen to the demonstration, verse 8. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, Cast out demons. You receive without pay and give without pay. There are two signs that have and always will accompany the gospel. True gospel proclamation, and that is healing and deliverance. And Jesus' sermon was simple, right? It's kind of hard to forget what he told them to go out and preach. It was simple. What was it? He said, proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the sermon that they preached. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the proclamation. The demonstration that accompanied that proclamation was healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, casting out demons. Which means what? If the kingdom of heaven is at hand, so or therefore the finger of God must be near. If the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the finger of God is near you. Literally, the gospel and deliverance go hand in hand. Deliverance is the finger of God, the finger of the kingdom of God here on earth. So Jesus, as God on earth, introduces the personal deliverance ministry. Where... Let's back up for just a few moments because this is how Jesus sent out his disciples, but let's back up just a few moments. I kind of got ahead of myself. Where did Jesus initiate the deliverance ministry? Let's look at next one of the first, if not the very first deliverance that's associated with Jesus' ministry. It's Mark chapter 1. i tell you what. Let me pull up the screen share, and then we'll go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Mark chapter 1, verse 21 through 28. Let's read that. It says, And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. At this point in Jesus' life and ministry, Jesus has just begun his ministry. He has just called his first disciples, and immediately after calling his disciples on church day, which at that time was the Sabbath, the holy day of rest, which, by the way, that's Saturday. But now, as a church, we celebrate on Sunday because that's the day of Jesus' resurrection. We see that reference both in Acts chapter 20 and 1 Corinthians 16, that the church shifts to Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. 
All right, so Jesus has gone into a church service, into the synagogue on a Sabbath, and Jesus is teaching. Jesus goes into the contemporary church with his newly called disciples, and he is teaching. He ain't even preaching yet, y'all. He ain't even preaching this time. He's just teaching. And the Bible said, Mark 1, they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes. Now, Mark, our author of this gospel account, is the cousin of Barnabas, who was a contemporary of the Apostle Paul, also an apostle himself. Um, the Bible mentions that. You can go back and look it up. But understand that as the, not Mark, the Bible calls Barnabas an apostle. Understand that as our author, Mark, was writing this, he was attempting to convey a point. And Mark's very first point is that Jesus taught them as one who had authority. Now, Jesus' understanding and teaching of the word was with authority. Somebody type that in the comments. Authority. Jesus taught with authority. He taught with power. And it's because Jesus was teaching from, if you study that term out, he was teaching from the realm of his governmental jurisdiction. Jesus was teaching them from his realm of governmental jurisdiction. He was talking about concepts that he was familiar with, things that he had understood and experienced while he was in heaven, subject matters that he understood intimately because Jesus is the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh. The incarnate word began to explain to the flesh of his kingdom the reality of the concepts he inspired within his word. Because, pause for just a moment, if we want to be real and honest with ourselves, the very first time deliverance took place wasn't on the earth, but it was within heaven. Jesus conducted deliverance in heaven, and he got the assistance of some angels, Michael, and they cast Satan and a third of the angels out of heaven. Listen, if heaven needs deliverance, the earth and God's kingdom here on the earth might need to partake in it as well. So the very first deliverance that takes place is in heaven. And Jesus says, listen, now that I'm here on the earth, I'm teaching things that I understand and that I experienced in heaven. And the kingdom of God that was in heaven is now being established as the kingdom of God here on the earth. I hope y'all are understanding. I hope this is making sense. Is this helping anybody out? Jesus taught with power. He taught concepts that he was already familiar with. Jesus came to the earth with the intentions of fulfilling the word, teaching the word, and releasing the word of the Lord. Before we can ever get into the deliverance ministry, we must understand that deliverance comes from authority in the word. This is why devils don't listen to some folk. It's obvious. Among either all that hooping and hollering or reading of Psalm 91, it, that you really don't know what you're talking about. The people of God saw clearly Jesus understands the word and Jesus brings relatable teaching. They said, he's got this thing figured out. Those scribes, it's obvious, even in all their time they spend reading the Bible, they don't have the authority to teach like this. They don't actually understand what's right in front of your face. You can't come to me and tell me that you are a deliverance minister and you are not a word minister first. Ministers minister to God before they ever minister to people. They minister to God on behalf of the people or they connect the people to God. But the primary function and role of a minister is to minister to God first. You can't be a deliverance minister and minister to God's people if you're not first a word minister. Verse 23 said, And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. Let, let, let me reread re that. I'm going to read that again. More slowly, this is the third time. And immediately, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. So Jesus is in the church service, teaching with authority, and immediately, right away, at once, there was inside of the church a man with an unclean spirit. Jesus started the deliverance ministry in the church for a reason. It's for the church. Remember I said 
that we're going to look at one of the first, if not the very first time that Jesus conducted deliverance. Where does he initiate the deliverance ministry inside the church? Now listen again what happened, how this demon began manifesting. In the interaction as Jesus begins to cast it out. Mark chapter 1, 24 through 26 said, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, ee, came out of him. If you've ever been a part of a deliverance session or a deliverance service, you've had the thought, is all that necessary? Let me be real with you. I don't know. I don't know if all that's really necessary. All I know is that that is how Jesus did it and the demon acted the same way when he did it. So Jesus rebukes the devil. Jesus says, be silent and come out of him. Oh, I hope Ooh, some of you are starting to feel that stirring. There's going to be some deliverance that breaks out at the end of this. Jesus says, be silent and come out of him. We have got to get to the point, church, that we understand the oil is for the healing ministry. The Bible is meant to be read. Hail Marys are for a football team. And somebody, please save some sage for grandmama's dressing. All you need, all we need, all I need are seven words in a good relationship with God to get a devil out. Be silent and come out of him. Be silent. Come out of him. Come out of her. The, the first deliverance took place within the church because deliverance is for the church. When Jesus sends out the 12 apostles, we talked about this just a few moments ago. They're still uncommissioned disciples. And we read this, but I want you to remember again what he said. Matthew 10, 7 and 8, Proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without pain, give without pay. So when Jesus then sends out his disciples, an element of evangelism, sharing about the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, which accompanies the healing ministry, is the deliverance ministry. I hope you caught that. It was the deliverance ministry which was initiated by Jesus as a personal ministry to believers. And a little later in Jesus' ministry, then he sends out the 72. So we've talked about how he began his ministry. Recap, we just talked about how he sent out the 12 when they're still, they're not apostles, they're uncommissioned disciples at this point. Then later in Jesus' ministry, he sends out more disciples. He sends out the 72. And I want you to listen to not how Jesus sends them out, but how they respond when they return to Jesus. This time we're going to be in Luke's gospel. It's Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20. It says, the 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus responds to them and said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He said, I saw the, the biggest in the first deliverance service. He said, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Now, somebody, you need to write that down. That verse is the verse of the Lord for you for right now. God says, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Not just part of the power, all the power, all the religious spirits, all those um, seducing spirits, all the spirits of witchcraft. I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. That's the word of the Lord for you. That's Bible. You can Bible that. Nothing. All the power of the enemy. I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The deliverance ministry is supposed to be easy to Christians. So easy that Jesus just shrugs it off when they come back. Jesus gives them the response like, what did you think was going to happen? Don't find your joy in casting out devils, church. Find your joy in your salvation and you will always be able to cast out demons. Don't find your joy in casting out devils. Find your joy in your salvation and you will always be able to cast out demons. All right, next, next passage, right? We're, we're progressing a little bit further into Jesus' ministry. This time, we're going to look at the tail end of Mark's gospel account, Mark chapter 16. Mark presents to us his rendition of 
the Great Commission. And listen to this. Mark chapter 16, verse 14 through 18. Afterward, Jesus appeared to the leaven themselves as they were reclining at table. And Jesus rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. They didn't believe when the women came back and told them the good news. Because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. Verse 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up servants with their hands. If they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So Jesus started his ministry. Then Jesus commissioned the twelve. Then Jesus commissions the 72. And finally, we have here Jesus commissioning the church, all believers. And during Jesus' great commissioning of the church, Jesus said that the first sign that will accompany all believers is what? Now, you, you go ahead and type the answer in the chat. I'm going to take a drink of coffee. Jesus said the first sign. That, that was pop quiz. Are you all ready for the answer? Let me know. Hopefully you've already typed the answer in there. Jesus said that the first sign that will accompany all believers is, in my name, they will cast out demons. The church has debated amongst all these like postulates and qualifications of what we can use to determine whether or not somebody's actually saved. But just hear me out for just a moment. Say, Jesus said the first thing that believers do is cast out devils. If you want to test the reality of your salvation, join the deliverance ministry. Have you ever noticed in the historical account of the sons of Sceva, and I'm not going to read that full passage today, but have you ever noticed how the demons responded to those young men? They said, it's Acts 19.15, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? These demons responded to these sons of the Jewish itinerant priests who were trying to be exorcists themselves. They said, I know Jesus. He's the Savior. I recognize this Paul that you mentioned because he's saved, but I don't know you because you don't know him. If you don't know Jesus, the deliverance ministry will make that plain to you. Ooh, Jesus, help us out. Let me reread that. Mark 16, 15 through 18. I'm not going to reread it, but Jesus basically gives them a three-part sermon. Right. He, I guess he'd been spending a lot of time with his cousin, John the Baptist. <laughs> Some of y'all catch that joke, joke a little bit later. You're going to catch that as you go into bed tonight. Jesus says, number one, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel of the whole of creation, which I might say the modern church has got to exchange the mentality of solely bringing the lost to the church. Can you do that if you're unsure of what to do? Absolutely, 100%. But the church, the gathering of the saints was designed by God to be an apostolic equipping and impartation hub for the holy ones of God. It, the, the, the gathering of the saints was designed for the saints. That's what the church means. The ecclesia is the gathering of the believers. The people of the church are intended by God to go out into the world which once again begs clarification for modern society because you have to go into the world. The believer must get so much God within them that they are capable of going into the world and bringing God with them to the world. Now I'm going to break this down and make it as simple as possible before we get back onto our topic. Because the church has spent so much time arguing over whether or not, listen, we've been doing this for like the last hundred years. Should the church be on TV? Oh, I don't like those televangelists. Should the church be on social media? Oh, those Facebook preachers aren't real preachers. Should the church be all over the internet? YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, you, you want to name it, threads, Facebook. The list goes on and on and on. If we fail as a whole to show up in the cloud, then we have failed our generation to show up where the world is gathering. I hope y'all are listening. You don't have to worry about as a Christian in 2023 showing up in a position of compromise. You don't have to worry about showing up to a bar, showing up outside of a club, showing up in any position of compromise to share your faith. All you have to do for the most part is show up online. The world is online. 
Do you know why? Do you know why the world has shifted and we are now in the season and position of ministry and life that the world is online? Do you know why? Because Satan has figured out that the church runs these streets. So the only place he has left to hide his strongholds now is somewhere that's not of this world. And he thought, I got to go find somewhere new to hide these people from the church. Jesus said, go into all the world. If we miss or we omit step one, we failed the whole great commission. The second thing that Jesus said in this three-part sermon after his resurrection, Jesus said, verse 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now go back and listen. I think it was last week's podcast. No, what week was that? Dear Lord Jesus, help me. Hey, we've been doing a lot of these now. Is that podcast number five? I got to look that up. Wow, we've been doing so many podcasts so quickly. Let me look it up. Listen, podcast number four. Dear Lord Jesus, that was so long ago. Can I be baptized again? Go back and listen to that episode if you missed it. But Jesus taught those who believe and are baptized are saved. Whoever does not believe is condemned. Therefore, in short, go back and listen to it. In short, baptism is the first must of salvation, but the baptism does not save you. All right, number three, this is our focus for today. Jesus said, all these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. If they drink any deadly poison or not hurt them, they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Listen, there's a lot in that, those couple verses. I know that. We're going to stop, and our assignment for today is the first part of that, all right? That's what we have time to talk about today. Jesus taught as his last main concluding point before leaving the earth, these signs will accompany those who believe. Which signs? These signs. He lists them out. He gives us some specifics next. We're going to focus on that first one in just a moment, but will accompany who? Will accompany only apostles? Will accompany only fivefold ministers? Will accompany only tenured and seasoned saints? No, no, and no. These signs will accompany those who believe. The church has been attempting for a long time to redefine this threshold or exam of what it takes to qualify as proof of salvation. However, Jesus gave it to us. And the proof of our salvation on the earth is found in the evidence of the signature of God upon our lives. This is the qualification for believers, for those who believe in Jesus and are actually really saved. All right, let's shift deeper into this topic. Because we know the deliverance ministry is a personal ministry, a personal matter now for the new covenant believer. And we've established that the deliverance ministry is for all believers to operate within. Jesus did, started his ministry like that. The 12 disciples, the 72, the whole church. We all got commissioned the same. Every believer has the same commission to operate in the deliverance ministry. It's the first sign of being a believer. So let's get into now really the question that we've been waiting for. This hot take question. Can a Christian have a demon? And I need you to understand something up front. I want you to understand something about your relationship with Jesus as a believer. This also has to do about your relationship with the Father through Jesus and about your relationship with Holy Spirit because of Jesus. The Bible has two words to describe the most endearing concept to us all, two Greek terms. There's a Greek term which is translated as salvation, and a separate Greek term, which is translated as saved. Now, if you've been following my ministry for long, the term saved, you're probably going to be more familiar with this concept that's translated as saved. Saved comes from this Greek root word of sozo. There's other there, there's a few different endings, multiple different endings to that word, depending on how it's conjugated for that um that context, but the root word is the same for saved. It's sozo. Let me pull up logos because I want to, I want to show you, oh dear Lord Jesus, what did I just do? Okay. Y'all are still there. It's still on. All right. We're doing good. I clicked on something. So if that got interesting for you, that's, that's amazing. If it didn't praise the Lord, hallelujah. It got really crazy over here for me. The screens just totally shifted on me. Let me pull up logos. Let me get you over to Logos. Now we're there. Now we're actually making some progress. We're going to be in the New Testament. 
as we're talking about the Greek language, let me scroll down to Romans. I'm going to pull up both of our references from Romans, actually. Romans 10, 9. You've probably heard this a lot. This is something that the liturgical brothers and sisters absolutely love quoting. Let me close out these old word studies. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. It says, because if you confess with your heart, or blah, you can't confess with your heart, dear Lord Jesus, quoting the word got wrong, Jesus, forgive me. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There we go. For with the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Let's look at this term saved here. All right, let me click on this. Scroll down, we're going to do a Bible word study on saved. Now you can see right here, it tells you that's the Greek term sozo. Sozo means a couple of different things. Let me expand this so I can kind of show you some of these. It means healing of the flesh. There's the word heal, all these different resources. It means to rescue. I usually use the term restoring or redemption. That's talking about the realm of the soul, soul restoration, the rescuing of the soul. Um, you can pull up if you really want to get into this. I'll put the link for Logos down at the bottom. If you want to look through these resources, you don't have it yet. I'll put the discount link up for you to be able to register for that. Um, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. You can go and study everything that I'm saying here in more depth but I'm going to try to cover it quickly for our time, um, and deliverance of the spirit. So sozo means healing of the flesh, rescuing of the soul, and deliverance of the spirit. Now, I want to also make this clear because the term sozo is usually what is used in the more charismatic and Pentecostal persuasions, um, and you, it's kind of cutting it off here. It's it's a couple different resources, theological lexicon of the New Testament, um, this other lexicon. It means to preserve. Here we are, right here. Preserve. It's another intrinsic meaning of the definition of this term, sozo. It also means to preserve something to keep it safe. So when you are saved, you've been given access to, let me pull you back up over here. There we go. When you are saved, you've been given access to healing of the flesh, redemption of your soul, and deliverance of the spirit. It's all within the definition of that same term that we translate as saved. We understand that Jesus doesn't just provide that for us at the moment of salvation, but we inherit what we know as a lifetime of salvation, going through the process of sanctification and finally entering into the glorification when we are going into the Father's presence in heaven. So we've got the moment of justification, the process of sanctification, our ultimate glorification. Deliverance doesn't just mean getting you free. Deliverance means getting you to your final destination. Our, listen, spirit-filled believers would do well to gain that understanding from our liturgical brothers and sisters. Prime Day happened uh, several weeks ago now. It's been probably like a month ago. If you participated in Prime Day, your favorite moment wasn't when you paid the price. Oh, Lord Jesus, somebody help me preach this in the comments. Your favorite moment wasn't when you paid the price, but when the goods you purchased were delivered to you. I don't know if any of you are like tracking fanatics out there like myself, but from the moment that I place my order and I paid the price, I track the moment they create the label, the moment they put the product into the package and they put the label on it, the moment UPS, USPS, FedEx picks up my package, when they take it to the hub of origination, when it's there in that hub and it goes or it goes from the local place to the hub and then the hub flies it to my hub and my hub delivers it to the, the local place of delivery and then the local place of delivery. When it's out from delivery and I'm watching it every moment to find the latest update to know on the tracking and what time is this supposed to be delivered to me today? I ain't waiting for no demon of delay. I want to know when it's going to be delivered. Your favorite moment wasn't when you paid the price, but when the goods that you purchased were delivered to you. God is here both for your deliverance from the demonic and your delivery to him. God paid the price and he's all about us getting deliverance from the demonic 
oppression, possession that's in upon our lives. But God's ultimate focus and goal is his is our delivery to him. God is here both for your deliverance from your the demonic and your delivery unto him. Saved. Sozo, healing, rescuing, deliverance. Yet the Bible utilizes a different term to discuss salvation. There's another word entirely that's translated as salvation. It's not connected to sozo. It's a different root word in and of itself. And if you're familiar with theological concepts, you may have heard of this one. The study of our salvation, theologically, scholars use this term known as soteriology. And that's because of the Greek term that the root word that salvation is translated from. And that's the Greek root word soteria. Now, let's shift back over to logos. We're going to be back in Romans again because they're both words that are utilized by the Apostle Paul. I'm going to pull up one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Romans 1.16. And so I don't do like I did earlier. I'm going to read it because I got ahead of myself. My tongue in my mouth got ahead of my mind. I misquoted the Word of God, and it's recorded on here for everybody. Jesus, please help me. All right. Romans 1, 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, or some translations translate that as Gentiles. All right, let's do that word study one more time. This is a different Greek root word. Let me expand it. This is the word soteria that I mentioned. Now, soteria has several different meanings within its definition as well. Soteria in the Greek means also to rescue. So there's the soul realm and deliverance. Multiple times you're seeing deliverance, to deliver, deliverance, salvation, deliverance, salvation, right? It's all throughout all of that as you're looking down there. And wouldn't you know it, this term also represents, it's cut off once again, there it is, preservation. Wouldn't you know it, it also includes preservation. People who have a greater understanding, this is one that's typically the perspective that's taught in seminaries and Bible schools, Bible colleges. People who have a greater understanding of this concept of salvation typically are those who have a firmer grasp on the preservation of the saints. People who understand soteriology are the ones who are teaching and preaching about the preservation of the saints. Why? Because they understand that by definition, salvation includes preservation. I'm going to talk about this next week. I'll tell you, I think a little bit later, the fullness of next week's topic, but I'm going to touch base. We're going to go deeper on this next week. Salvation includes preservation. But the Bible uses two words to describe our understanding of salvation and being saved, not just one. Which means we can't afford to hang out in either camp because there's the sozo camp and there's the soteria camp. There's the healing camp and there's the preservation camp. We can't hang out in either one of those camps. We have to hang out in the equipped camp, which understands both of these are biblical. Either one absent of the other one biblically is incomplete. The greatest differentiation or distinction between sozo and soteria or being saved in the concept of salvation is salvation includes rescuing of the soul and deliverance of your spirit, while Sozo saved includes rescuing your soul, deliverance of your spirit, and healing of the flesh. Your salvation results in you being saved. They're interconnected and biblically salvation begets being saved. But philosophically, we might say we need salvation prior to being saved. But in the eyes of man, chronologically, I suggest they should come together in that same moment. Now, poor poor teaching doesn't always give us that capacity in modern times. You know, you've got to teach people that Jesus is insufficient to meet all of your needs. Because anyone who believes in Jesus believes he can do it all. You got to teach somebody otherwise. They be- we be- we- when we come to Jesus, everybody believes Jesus can do it all until we're taught otherwise. I'm going to really step into a preach here in a moment if I ain't careful. Listen, how can you tell me, how are you going to tell me that Jesus can get you free from a legion of demons, but he's incapable of healing you from a cold? 
Somebody make it make sense in the comments. Make it make sense. Yet, while these two concepts are different, notice first their commonalities. It's not just for the restoration, redemption, rescuing of your soul, but both concepts of salvation and being saved include in the very nature of their definition, deliverance. There has never been and never will be a biblical concept connected to your salvation that did not include your deliverance. Can a Christian get deliverance? You don't get saved without it. Now, it may look different and it may come in different forms or in various manners, but deliverance comes by salvation in Christ alone. There's no other way to get deliverance. And I know there's folks out there who say, you can't have a demon after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm just thankful that they made clear to all of us, they just made clear that they don't read the Bible. Because the trending question is, do believers need deliverance or can a Christian have a demon? Now listen, Matthew 16. Let's shift into Matthew chapter 16 because we're going to really get into that full answer of this question. Matthew 16 opens up with the Pharisees and Sadducees demanding a sign. Wouldn't you know it? And Jesus concludes with the te his teaching on the sign of Jonah. Next, Jesus then warns his disciples concerning the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, their teaching. Then Peter confesses, Matthew 16, he confesses Jesus as Christ. What is this? It's a salvation confession. Whether or no, not this is the moment that Peter gets saved, it's up for debate. I'll give that to you. But we know this is a moment that Peter believes in his heart and he confesses that Jesus is the Christ. The very next moment is the passage I want us to focus on. I'm going to go back and reread some of that for context. Matthew 16, I'm going to read six, verse 16 through 23. Listen to the full context of this. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, translators make this the next paragraph, but understand this is the very next thought and the very next thing that happens, right? There's no separation of time. From that time, verse 21, from that time, that exact moment in time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Verse 22, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. Peter goes from confessing Christ to being admonished by Jesus, saying this teaching will cause the gates of hell to not prevail against it, to immediately catching rebuke from Jesus. Not for having some petty little demon either, but for opening the door and letting Satan possess him. Jesus doesn't even speak to Peter because Peter's not even who's talking. Peter's in such need of deliverance that Peter is possessed by Satan. Jesus conducts deliverance on Peter and casts out Satan. What happens? Peter receives deliverance. How do I know? Because just a few chapters later in the Bible, the Bible tells us that Satan now enters into, inside of Judas. Listen to Luke chapter 22, verse 3. It says, Then Satan entered into Judas' called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. This wasn't some figurative speech or hyperbole. Peter really got deliverance from Satan just then, y'all. And, and after Judas commits suicide, what happens? Satan goes right back trying to trying to possess believers. Because, and I'll prove that to you in just a moment, because the follow-up to that is always, well, that was before the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Can a believer who's received the baptism of the Holy Spirit have a demon? Now we're going to fast forward to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 ends with Peter and John back in the fellowship of the believers. They just survived a trial. 
that was largely comprised of the very same council, council responsible for Jesus' crucifixion. And I'm going to jump in and read for y'all in the middle of their prayer. Acts chapter 4, verse 29 through 31. It says, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders were performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. They pray for boldness to preach the gospel. While God performs signs and wonders through the name of Jesus. And the whole place and all the people were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, what's interesting about this is Peter and John got the Holy Ghost the first time. If you recall in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit originally poured out, they all got the Holy Ghost. They all received it the first time. What's interesting about this, Peter and John received the baptism of the Holy Spirit the first time, but some capacity or some residence had opened up inside of them as they proclaimed the gospel and they poured out the oil and they were persecuted and they received an additional infilling of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's pretty fantastic. But also everyone who was now a part of the church also had that same Pentecostal experience. If you'll recall, on the day of Pentecost, the whole house was filled. It was shaken, right? The sound of this mighty rushing wind of heaven. And then they all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, began speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And that day, 3,000 souls were added to the church. Well, here we have just two chapters later, there's all these people and they have the same Pentecostal experience. So if Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit again, the only logical conclusion is there must have been capacity or space that Holy Spirit could have filled inside of him. Same with Peter and John, right? Same with both Peter and John. See, Peter's already been filled with Satan at this point, and he doesn't want that to happen again. So he comes back to the church and he says, I need y'all to pray with me for boldness, and he gets filled with the Holy Spirit again. He doesn't want to be filled with Satan again. He understands there's capacity, residence opened up within him. There, there's, there is a location inside of him which a spirit must take residence and possess. It immediately says following this, though, we're not done. We're not done. Somebody type in the comments, we're not done yet. He's, he's not done yet. It immediately says following this, after all of them are filled with the Holy Spirit, that they were all of, of one heart and of one soul and had everything in common. And they were all selling possessions, homes, land, and laying the profit, the money, not the person, at the apostles' feet. And I want you to listen to this. It's the very next story that takes place historically in the church. It's Acts chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3 to start. It says, But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself a, a portion, a part of the proceeds of the land? And then Satan fills the heart of Ananias. Then I just tell y'all, what was Satan doing? Well, Judas dies. He goes back to looking. So which believer can I fill now? Ananias, the very end of Acts chapter 4, our, our last story, all of them were there. All the believers were there. Ananias had just been filled with the Holy Spirit. God, God was so mad about this that he knocked Ananias off right there. Acts 5.5 5 says, When Ananias heard these words from Peter, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. I'm sure. So, yeah, a Christian, even one who has just received the Holy Spirit, can have a demon and still need deliverance. Let's back up to one of Jesus' teachings, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 through, I think, 45. It says, this is Jesus' teaching about what happens when deliverance takes place. Matthew 12, 43 begins and says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person it passes through waterless places seeking rest but finds none then it says i will return to my house from which i came 
And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. So also it will be with this evil generation. I've oftentimes heard this preach and people will say, well, they'll end up seven times worse. No, they end up at minimum eight times worse because they've got that original demon and seven others that are even worse than the first one. Jesus said when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person. In other words, what did Jesus say? This person just got deliverance. And then he says, it will pass through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then that demon says, I'm going to go back to my crib. I'm going to go back to my house. What's that mean? That person was possessed. That demon owned them. There was a residence inside of that person that that demon had a stronghold that they occupied. If a demon leaves, lives in you, it means it owns you, right? It owns a portion of your life. Now, Paul's. Because I already said this, but deliverance from a regional spirit, like the spirit of the Egyptians, the Egyptian spirit is also a form of deliverance. I already said that. So you can be possessed or oppressed, but demonic bondage, when you become free, it's deliverance. I've already said that, but I felt the need to remind you. That demon said, I'm going to go back to, to, I'm going to go back home. I'm going to go back to my home. The Bible said, when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and it brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. And Jesus also adds it's going to be the same way in his generation, unless the house is filled. So a vacant house is open to any vagabond spirit or any spirit that's willing to squat long enough and receive ownership rights. So then the only way to protect the person who got deliverance is for another occupant, occupant, excuse me, another occupant to fill their house. Jesus calls his house the temple. What did the apostle Paul say? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. You receive deliverance. So glorify God in your body. So here's the great news. Holy Spirit can fill your temple, your house, your body. But the not so good news is things can happen and do oftentimes happen in life. Ministry, persecution, sin, trauma. Some of these things we choose and we enter into those things by our own accord. But there's sometimes things happen in our life that we have no choice in, right? We don't choose persecution. We don't choose trauma. That, that's choices of other people, states and impacts that happen because of this fallen world. And, and these situations in life that can open up capacity or residency, which requires that they be filled again, just like it happened with Peter and John, all those believers who had already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that capacity, that residency, which requires someone to fill it, it can be filled by any spirit. So this is why additional infillings of the Holy Spirit is pertinent to all believers as a part, a portion of our regimen in resisting the devil. What else was said? Well, and what else can we do? Well, from the beginning, the word and your faith has always protected you. But let me push that thought just a little bit deeper. Who can receive the Holy Spirit? Can a lost person? Absolutely not, which means it becomes irresponsible and dangerous to conduct deliverance on an unbeliever. I hope y'all are hearing me tonight. It becomes irresponsible and dangerous to conduct deliverance on an unbeliever because Jesus taught us through this parable the implication that unless they receive the Holy Spirit and fill the house, their last state will be worse than when they got the deliverance. I would go so far as to say, biblically, according to Jesus, deliverance is reserved for the believer. And as we receive deliverance, we should become equipped to preach the gospel. And as one of the first signs of our salvation, defined as biblically, healing of the flesh, redemption of the soul, deliverance of the spirit, one of the first signs of our salvation is the sign of deliverance accompanying our testimony. Woo, the word of God preaches strong. Hear what Jesus said. When he encountered this woman 
this mother whose child needed deliverance. It's also in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15, this is going to be one of the last stories before I conclude. Matthew 15, not the last word of God, but one of the last stories at least. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 through 28, it says, And Jesus went away from here and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon, but he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and they begged him, saying, Send her away, for she's crying out after us. He answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What did he say? I, I, I can only conduct deliverance on those who believe in God. I can only conduct deliverance at this time on believers. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it's not right to take the children's bread. Jesus said, pray every day for your my daily bread, my daily deliverance. Oh, Lord, It's not right to take the children's bread, deliverance, and throw it to the dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, but even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. You're still the master. And Jesus said to her, he answered her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Jesus refuses to conduct deliverance on this woman's child because she's not of the house of Israel. She's not saved until she exhibits faith. Ephesians 2 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Jesus acknowledges for this woman the gift of God has come upon her. She's exhibiting faith. She's saved through her faith. So clearly we have Jesus establishing that the doctrine of deliverance is for the believer. It's not for the unbeliever. This is only further validated by those Greek terms that we studied earlier, saved and salvation. Some who receive deliverance, oh, this is going to bless somebody. This is for believers. But there are some who receive deliverance and they allow unnecessary shame to come in when those old demons show back up. And they need to go through deliverance again. Now, understand, I didn't say when the old man comes back because that's a baptism issue. Go back and listen to that podcast. Or can I get baptized again? Because that'll bless you. That'll provide some language and some wisdom for you. But when the old demons come back, that's a sign that you really got deliverance the first time. Your deliverance is not marked by how full the puke bucket was or by whether or not that demon came. It, it, your deliverance is marked by whether or not that demon comes back with some buddies. But Jesus, good news, Jesus got you free from that thing the first time. He's going to again, and from all his ugly buddies as well. Now, not only is deliverance reserved for the believer, it's ignorant and foolish to conduct deliverance on an unbeliever or someone who refuses to be filled with the Holy Spirit afterwards. That's the only way that deliverance can actually be maintained. People ask, well, what must I do to maintain my deliverance now that I got it? It's really simple. It's not difficult. It's in the Bible. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. He'll teach you what to do and convict you if necessary. And then, oh, by the way, devote yourself to the reading of the word because the word of God, the Logos, was given to us so that we could abide in our deliverance and understand the ways of God, the ways of God. I preached a few weeks ago talking about deliverance in a series called Summer Camp. Uh, it was equipped, was the theme of our summer camp this year at, at LifeBridge when I recorded this. And I went through 10 steps. If you're interested in being in the, the deliverance ministry, it was one of the last messages. I think it may have been the last message that I brought in that series. And I gave 10 steps to the deliverance ministry. Let me see if I can pull them up. I go through them very, very deep during that. Oh, man, it says that I've timed out. Let me see if it'll let me sign back in. 
Let me see if I can find the Sanyun. We need to give these to the work to the people of God. I'm gonna give them to you really, really quickly. I'm not gonna go through and explain. I elaborated on them very, very deeply when I brought that sermon to our local church. Um, but let me give you these ten steps. They're very quick. Most of them are pre-ministry, but you need to know these 10 steps. Number one, educate yourself. If you don't know what the Bible says about deliverance and who to do del deliverance on and when, don't be in the deliverance ministry. Know the Bible. So step number one, educate yourself. Number two, pray and fast. The Bible talks about some only come out by prayer and fasting. When the disciples couldn't cast them out, Jesus cast out the devils. And he told them, go back, go back and get in your secret place. Seek the face of the Father. That's why you couldn't do deliverance. You need to pray and fast some more. We don't need to stop the service and say, hey, come back in two weeks after I prayed and fast. We need to live a prayed up and fasted lifestyle. Number three, we got to have a conversation with the person. I don't believe in having conversations with demons. They're liars. Demons are liars. There's no reason to talk to them. But have a conversation with the person before you get started. How long is this going on? Is this inner healing that they actually need? Do they need to forgive somebody first? When did this demon come in? Did it come in because of a source of trauma? Are they in unrepentant sin? We need to know those kinds of things. This personal advice, step number four, never do deliverance alone. Jesus sent out the 12 in pairs. He sent out the 72 in pairs. Um, it's a great thing. Have somebody that's leading the deliverance session, but it's good to do deliverance, not alone. Number five, start deliverance. When we start deliverance, we're going to start deliverance like Jesus. Jesus said, be silent, come out of them. That's what you need for deliverance. Be silent and come out of them. I always encourage people, make sure spiritually you are seated in a position of authority. Ephesians 2, 6 says that God has raised us up with him and seated us with him being Jesus in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Conduct deliverance from this position of spiritual authority. This is a position of rest and authority, not a position of works and warfare. Number six, cast that devil out of them. The Greek term is the Greek term ekbalo. It means to expel, to drive out, to cause to be, to make become, to throw out. It indicates force. Jesus had expelled them with force, right? Jesus expelled them with force. Number seven, if you can, begin with the highest ranking demon. Deliverance for most people comes in layers and in levels. Many people get deliverance throughout their walk with Christ and in different manners. Demons operate in different levels. You can find that in Ephesians 6, 1. That's a whole nother teaching. Maybe I'll get into that at some other point. Number eight, make sure they really got deliverance. Number nine, fill them with the Holy Spirit. If you don't fill them with the Holy Spirit afterwards, you are being selfish and you are only in the deliverance ministry for yourself. I said it. It needed to be said. Number 10, give them some additional steps for discipleship because they need to know how to maintain their Deliverance, not only do they need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, they need to understand how to be disciples who understand the Word of God. Jesus said, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. I like to start with this one verse, and I'm going to pray for you, for those of you who may need some deliverance after this. Let me give you this verse, because there is power when we decree the Word of God. And as we start to speak the Word of God, that deliverance comes forth. Let me give you this verse. It's James 4, 7. James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote this in his epistle. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The very first step for deliverance, submit yourself to God. If you're a believer, come to God, confess your sins, forgive whoever you need to forgive, submit yourself in every area of your life to God, then resist the devil. If you know what demon it is, call it out by name. If not, it's a demon, it's a devil, call it out. Just say, devil, I bind you, I cast you out. You don't have to, Jesus said, be silent, come out. He didn't take a whole, what's your name, where's your phone number, and what's your address, and who's your favorite grandmama, and who do you hang out with? Jesus said, be silent, come out. I don't even know all that. Only one time did he ask, who is this? And it was when there was a legion. It was so that his disciples knew, hey, there's more than one that's coming out this time. We need to be ready because this is going to be different. Jesus was conducting, it was actually deliverance from a regional spirit at that time. I need to be quiet and quit teaching. And it, James said, and then he will flee from you. When you are submitted to God and you resist the devil, 
he's got no choice but to flee. You will get your deliverance. If you're submitted to God and resisting him, you will get your deliverance. Then ask for Holy Spirit to come and fill you and educate yourself in the word. Go, get back into the word. Give yourself word, Bible, to defend yourself against the enemy, to defend yourself, to heal yourself. The Bible is made for our healing. It gives us the ability to heal ourselves from those wounds so the devil doesn't come back. Let me take a drink of water and I'll pray for you. One way that I like to initiate times of deliverance is by praying in the Spirit. When you pray in the Spirit, any spirit that's not the Holy Spirit is really not going to like it. So if I, as I start to pray and you feel something on you, you start to feel yourself maybe getting angry, maybe you feel like you're going to get sick, listen, get sick, let it come out if it needs to come out. Listen, it's not the deliverance ministry isn't always pretty, but it's always effective. Um, if you start to feel pain in part of your body, put your hand on that part of the body, command that devil to come out. Listen, I'm here to agree with you. The Bible says when two of us agree about anything here on earth, it'll be done all the way up in heaven. That means the devil, no matter what rank it is, it can't stop what's happening in the throne room. So this is where we're at. We are submitted to God. We are seated in Christ Jesus, we found our seat of authority, and let's pray. So I'm going to pray for you. Some of you are going to experience deliverance. If you are not receiving deliverance, pray in the Spirit with me. Pray for your brothers and sisters, those who are watching this, who are receiving deliverance. And after we pray a time of deliverance, we're going to pray for you to be filled as well. All right, so I want you to begin praying with me. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. We welcome you here to come into these houses, these cars, these places of dwellings. Holy Spirit, I thank you. I thank you that you bring deliverance swiftly. I thank you for your sons and your daughters, those that you love even greater than I do. <sighs> Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here in our midst. I thank you, Jesus, that it is by your blood that these individuals are saved, that they have become sons and daughters in their salvation. Father, in their salvation, you have promised their deliverance. Because they are saved, they are delivered. And I command their bodies to fully align up to the deliverance that belongs to their salvation in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that right now we are seated in Christ Jesus, in the heavenly places by which we conduct this spiritual warfare. Father, I speak to every demonic assignment, every demon of hell, and I put you on notice that this is your time of eviction. Oh, Devil, I speak to you right now in the name of Jesus, and I bind you. I bind your mouth. I bind your manifestations. You will not twist and pervert and manipulate and convulse this child of God any longer. I command you, devil, be silent. Come out. Devil, you shall be silent. Come out now in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is against you. Jesus, I thank you that your blood is powerful. It's more powerful than any demonic covenant. It's more powerful than any word curse. It's demonic than it is more powerful. I bind right now every spirit of confusion and every demon of delay in the name of Jesus. Jesus, your blood is more powerful than every demonic agreement, than every demonic covenant. It is broken now in the name of Jesus. Jesus, I bind that devil. I speak over your sons and your daughters' freedom. Devil, I bind you. Devil, now is the time for you to come out. Be silent and come out. 
be silent and come out. Come out. Come out. Come out. Come out now. Up and out. Up and out. All the way out. All the way out. Every devil, I command you to come out now. I don't care your rank. I don't care your authority. I don't care your assignment or how you get. Oh, shakara. Come out now. Come out now in the name of Jesus. All the way out. There it is, son. There it is, daughter. Full freedom in the name of Jesus. All the way out. All the way out. Everybody, every demonic assignment that was let in from that first devil, you're not going to hide. You're not going to hide. We know you're there, devil. I command you to be silent. Come out now. All the way out. All the way out. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I see you in the spirit, daughter. I see you crying. It's okay. Witchcraft comes out oftentimes through tears. Cry it out. Cry it out. Son, it's okay. I feel, I can feel it in the spirit, down in the depths of your inner man, it coming out of you now. It's okay. It's okay, son. Release it fully. Release it fully. Receive now your full deliverance. Your full deliverance. All the way up. All the way up. All the way up. All the way. Come out now, devil. There it is now. There it is. There it is. You can feel that lifting. Many of you can feel that, that, that emptiness inside of you. That's okay. That's that capacity. It's okay. And I just want you to pray with me. Say, Holy Spirit, fill me. Holy Spirit, fill me. Holy Spirit, we know that you're here. You're the one who's guiding and leading this deliverance. Even for those that's watching on replay, it doesn't matter. You are there in that moment, in this moment with them. Even though I'm absent from you in body, the word of God said, the apostle Paul said, I'm present with you in spirit. Even when you're watching on the replay, no matter when you're watching this, even though I'm absent from you with body, I'm present with you right now in spirit. The spirit of the living God is here with you. Open yourself up and Holy Spirit, we permit you, we allow you to take residency within your son and daughter. Fill them up now. Holy Spirit, from the tips of their toes to the height of their head, fill them up. Rivers of living water. I see some of you right now beginning to just cry out, to beginning to pray in the Spirit. Let those tongues flow. Let the Spirit of God fill you up and begin to erupt. Even new tongues are coming out of you now. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I thank you for filling up your son, for filling up your daughters. Fill up every crack, every crevice, every occupancy, every void that the Holy that has been made by demonic entities, demonic openings, demonic oppression, possession, those traumas. Heal every crack. You are the potter, God. We are the clay. Fill those cracks and fill your sons and daughters completely with your spirit. Open up and receive him now. Receive him now. Here's coming an additional outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Receive him now. (sighs) Holy Spirit, fill them up now. Fill them up now. Listen, I'm going to pray over you and bless you. Some of you are there. I can see in the spirit. Some of you have even fallen out in the floor. That's okay. That happens sometimes as we receive additional infillings of the Holy Spirit. That's okay. You just let the Spirit of God continue to minister to you now. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Deliverance is for you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for you. This is why Jesus came. It is how Jesus ministered. It's part of why he died on the cross. It's how Jesus did ministry. It's how Jesus does ministry. Deliverance is for the believer. Absolutely, Christians can have a demon, but guess what? We can have the Holy Spirit. We can receive additional infillings of the Holy Spirit as well. We can get to this place where we're completely and totally delivered and we're completely and totally filled. And just like Peter and John, when moments come in that press against us, that demand our oil, that cause us to pour out, when persecution comes and it creates capacity within us, we can immediately go back to the gathering of the saints. That very next day, we can go to the church and say, hey, pray for me to have boldness and we can receive additional infillings of the Holy Spirit. And we can create a life lifestyle where we resist the devil and we never give him the capacity to come back in again. So I'm going to pray over you and bless you. Father, I thank you for there is wisdom in your word. I thank you for lifestyles where we receive 
your Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for all the believers that we receive boldness to continue to proclaim your word of God. Holy Spirit, we ask for you now. We echo the words of the prayer of Peter and John, the apostles of our faith. And Father, we ask right now for boldness. <laughs> Even those who had received the Holy Ghost receiving any additional infilling now. Boldness to continue to proclaim your word, God. Give us boldness. Even those who didn't receive deliverance before, Father, fill them now with the living Holy Spirit. Fill us up now. I see some of you, the Lord is going to begin to take you into time of groanings. Even after this podcast ends, it's an invitation for groanings. The Holy Spirit praying through you with utterances too deep for understanding of man. It's literally God talking to God on your behalf. The Holy Spirit interceding to Jesus, who's making intercessions on your behalf right now to the Father. God talking to God, talking to God on your behalf. I feel that. The Holy Spirit inviting you into intercessions, groanings right now in Jesus. I thank you for being on this podcast. Jesus, we pray these things in your name. Thank you for being on here with me today. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode, but I want you to to testify what the Lord's done on this podcast for you, what he does after this time ends today. I love you, and I will see you guys very soon. Thank you for watching the More Than a Church podcast with me. I'll see you soon.